If you now want to go back, if you now want to increase it actually what you need to do is to take into account the non Newtonian nature of blood. It does not follow this sort of a linear uh, stress strain relationship that I assume for a Newtonian fluid. If you take that then you can recover back these sort of more accurate estimates, but even within these approximations uh, unless you are really precisely interested in that getting back to that number. So, that is what I wanted to show that the Newtonian approximation you should keep it at the back of your mind that these are not Newtonian fluids, but often you come across cases where the Newtonian approximation is not too bad. You can take that the fluid is in behaves like a Newtonian fluid and at least order of magnitudes you will maybe get correct. Huh? The last one, this one, this one this is the stress strain relationship, this is the definition of my viscosity remember. The stress force per unit area is proportional to the rate of change of the velocity and the constant of proportionality is my coefficient of viscosity. Remember last class we talked about this and this was true or rather this was this is is what I used to define a Newtonian fluid that any fluid which has a stress strain relation stress uh, strain relation like this is what I will call as my Newtonian fluid. If you had uh, non Newtonian fluids like shear thinning or shear thickening, there would be an exponent n here which would be greater than or less than 1 depending on the type of fluid. Yes. So, you are sort of you are pumping blood through these vessels right through an active like the heart is pumping or whatever that creates a pressure differential across the length of these tubes. That number is sort of an estimate from experiments of what is the correct pressure differential to use for a capillary roughly of that length. Hmm? It is a mean of course, it is it has its own dynamics and so on, but that is a sort of rough estimate of the number. So, we are also talking about these Reynolds numbers remember and the Reynolds number like I said we defined as this ratio of inertial forces to viscous forces which was this um, rho L u by eta. So, the same fluid uh, with a given uh, density and a given viscosity can behave like this sort of uh, low can if you put an object in that same fluid uh, you can have this low Reynolds number flows or high Reynolds number flows depending on the size scale and the velocity scale of the object. So, it is not just a property of the fluid, it is a composite property of this object moving through the fluid itself. Okay. There is a couple of other ways. Uh, so, just uh, one to get at the same Reynolds number expression. Reynolds number is rho L u by eta, right. So, again, so let us say I have this fluid. I have this fluid, I just take a small parcel of this fluid of some size uh, a which is traveling with a velocity u ok. You can estimate what is the kinetic energy that is contained in this fluid parcel. So, the kinetic energy of this fluid parcel is uh, half m v square m is like the density of the fluid times the volume which is like a cubed and v square right. So, this is again I am not putting in coefficients and so on, but this is the order of magnitude of the kinetic energy that is contained in this parcel of flow. It is rho a cubed u square. You can also estimate what is the energy that is dissipated by the viscous forces as this fluid parcel is moving in this fluid. So, you can estimate the work done by the viscous forces. Right. What is work? It is so work done by the viscous forces as it moves a distance comparable to its size again. So, I take this as the size scale in my system. 
So, that is force into distance, force is uh, stress. Uh, so, that is my force per unit area. So, that is eta into my velocity scale by my length scale that is my stress uh, into the area which is a and then the distance that I know. So, this just to clarify this is my stress from this stress strain relationship for a Newtonian fluid. This is a measure of my area stress is force per unit area. So, force per unit area into area is my force and into the distance moved is my work. So, this is the work done by the viscous forces as this fluid parcel moves the length which is comparable to its own size and that is uh, so eta u a square right. So, again if you take the ratio of these two the kinetic energy of the fluid parcel uh, compared to the work done uh, by the viscous forces as it moves the distance comparable to its length. So, if you take these two ratios k e by this w viscous again you will get so rho a cubed u square by eta u a square. So, this is rho a u by eta which is again the same as this. So, what it says is that if this if this viscous work is much larger than this kinetic energy of the parcel. So, again Reynolds number is very small this viscous drag will quickly dissipate the kinetic energy. So, it will just move a little bit before this viscous drag has dissipated all the kinetic energy that was in this parcel ok. So, that is this limit of this low Reynolds number. So, it, it will not have these inertial terms. So, uh, something moving with velocity v will not continue to move with velocity v. This viscous drag will very quickly dissipate the energy and it will come to a stop. So, that is physically this regime of low Reynolds numbers ok. So, just to get a sense of what these numbers look like. So, these are some estimates from this paper in development. So, these are these interstitial flows are I do not know where the for I do not know if you can see the figure, but um, so these are interstitial flows. So, flows in between in spaces between the tissues and these are very low Reynolds number much much less than 1. These are cilia driven flows like for example, cilia in your inner ear, ear um, the cerebrospinal fluid these all fall in these low Reynolds number like less than 1. And then you can have these vascular flows which can be laminar or turbulent. So, laminar is in this roughly in around this 1 range or this turbulent flows would be this high Reynolds number range ok. So, mostly at the scale of cells and so on the flows that we are interested in are fall within this low Reynolds number range 10 to the power of minus 3, minus 4 and so on. I actually have one more graph which might be better. So, for example, just to uh, take a look. So, the reference is cut off for whatever reason. So, here are Reynolds number estimates from different fields of biology so roughly related to development. So, for example, an oocyte growing in C. elegans the worm that has a Reynolds number of 10 to the power of minus 6. Then this development of this left right asymmetry in vertebrates. So, the fact that your left is different from your right that is driven by motile cilia I will actually show that the Reynolds number in that context is around 10 to the power of minus 3. The flow of cerebrospinal fluid again driven by cilia is 10 to the power of minus 1 and so on. So, most of these numbers you will see are very small numbers uh, 10 to the power of minus 3, minus 1, minus uh, 6 and so on. So, these are very, very these are very low Reynolds numbers uh, which means that this assumption of using not using the full Navier Stokes, but using only the Stokes equation. So, neglecting all in inertial terms will work very well if you are talking about fluid fluid problems uh, in this in these sort of ranges in this sort of Reynolds number ranges. So, here is a couple of examples 
from this previous slide actually. So, this is an oocyte growth uh, in C. elegans. So, let me just explain this figure. This is the gonad of a C. elegans. Remember, C. elegans is this worm, right? It is a nematode. This is one part of its body, the gonad. Uh, here are the embryos of the C. elegans. Uh, these what is known is that these uh, these oocytes uh, do not have any transcriptional machinery which means that these oocytes cannot produce their own mrna or proteins however mrna and proteins do get there because when these embryos are going to develop they are going to need those mrna and proteins so what the c elegans does is that it pushes in this cytoplasm from these regions so, from these distal regions of the gonad, it will push it into these developing oocytes until it has the amount that it needs. So, these are experiments where it actually tracks the flow of these cytoplasms across this gonad. So, the gonad is this U like structure, and if you look at this, so these are plots of particle trajectories roughly over a 2 minute period. So, these are tracks of a single particle over 2 minutes, and you can see that they very nicely flow along this direction. So, in fact, if you see this movie, uh, you can see the, all this stuff literally. So, this is this portion of your uh, of the gonad stuff flows in like this, goes around the U bend and goes into this developing oocyte. So, these are the developing oocytes. So, all the cytoplasm, the yolk particles, they get sort of incorporated, coming in from here and then flowing into this region. And this sort of this this is called cytoplasmic streaming in C. elegans, and this roughly has this sort of a Reynolds number, ten to the power of minus six. You can actually these are some very nice experiments. You can actually put outside. So this is an oil drop which you put by hand. Um, just to show that these uh, this transport happens because of a fluid flow, there are not any active mechanisms that biologically specific mechanisms that are driving this flow. You just throw in a non reactive oil drop, and this oil drop is if you throw in it over there, that oil drop is going to be carried along by the fluid flow and go again into the oocyte. On the other hand, if you were to put in very large oil drop, which is this movie. The, so, this is a very large oil drop which sort of impedes this flow. Now, stuff cannot flow in through it, through flow past it, you sort of stop this cytoplasmic stream. Uh, the movies might be clearer there. So, stuff has stopped flowing and this oocytes do not develop as normally unlike the in this case. So, it is a actually, so it is a problem in developmental biology which is driven by this sort of a fluid flow a very Rowan Reynolds number fluid flow which carries all the cytoplasm into the developing oocytes. Similarly, this is another example um, this is in mice if I remember I cannot see anything in this uh, movie. So, in vertebrates we have this left right asymmetry right uh, the left side of our body is not the same as the right and there has been a lot of work on how this asymmetry initially develops. Uh, so, this is some work in mice uh, where it says that these cilia uh, sort of beat in a very coordinated counterclockwise fashion which leads to a flow towards the from the right up to the left of the embryo and that sets up this sort of a gradient which leads to this asymmetry between the left and the right. Uh, let me see. If this were to play properly, these were cilias which were beating, but anyway, you can look at the still images. These are tracer particles that are put into the ciliary flow. So, the cilia beats in a counterclockwise way that generates a flow, and you can tag these particles and show that these particles go from the right to the left. So, they establish a sort of axis. This is a similar sort of thing. This is a mutant where you have where you mutate a kinesin family protein that stops this uh, counterclockwise beating of the cilia and in that case you do not see any uh, directional flow anymore all these 
uh, tracker particles that you put they sort of go ahead and do their own thing. So, you can randomize this. So, this from actually this paper you can randomize this left right asymmetry by uh, playing around with this motor protein it is a kinesin family protein KIF 3 Okay, So, again it is a process in development which is driven by these fluid flows generated by the beating of this CDL. And this if we go back to this table this left right asymmetry this again has a Reynolds number it is driven by these motile cilia and it again has a Reynolds number of around 10 to the power of minus 3. So, most Reynolds numbers that we will talk about in biology fall in this sort of a class where the Stokes equation becomes the right approach to use ok. This I will not do uh, this is the Stokes flow past a sphere I thought about doing it but then you can work out uh, the solution of the Stokes equation past a sphere and you can show that this viscous drag is this famous 6 pi eta r v formula. If you want I can upload if you if you have not done it in a continuum mechanics course or so I can upload how to derive this 6 pi eta r v. Okay. All right. So, for the final thing I will just move on to a slightly different thing which is this process of um, centrifugation ok. So, often you so, this is an experimental technique and again it relies on this uh, low Reynolds number physics where the velocity is proportional to the force. So, I just thought I will discuss that. So, here is a process where you are centrifuging some stuff in a test tube. For example, you take a blood sample and you put it in a centrifuge what it does is that it will separate the different components of the blood into different layers right. So, this is one layer of red blood cells, here is a layer of white blood cells, here is a layer of plasma and so on. How does this generally work? How this works is that if you spin this sample you generate a centrifugal force which is like your m omega square r right depending on with what uh, angular velocity you are spinning the centrifuge. So, let me call this as my centrifugal acceleration G c and if you are at low Reynolds numbers this force that you are generating through this rotation will impart a drift velocity to these particles right. So, the force that you generate so, you have you have some force which is m times G c this is going to give rise to some drift velocity gamma times V d right. So, the the drift velocity is then going to be given by this mass is density in let us assume a spherical particle of radius r and the drag is 6 pi eta r right. So, the drift well the main thing is that the drift velocity is proportional to the square of the size of the particle ok. So, if you have this suspension which is particles of different sizes different particles depending on their size will get a drift velocity depending on their r square ok. So, you have this initial mixture uh, initial homogeneous mixture which has maybe some large particles some small particles some medium particles. So, each of this is going to move with a different velocity v d which is proportional to their r square ok. But that is not all uh, so, you would you would expect that ok uh, after some time you would have one layer which are bigger particles, one layer which are medium particles, one layer which is smaller particles right. On the other hand these particles are also doing their own diffusive random walk which means that if you these layers will simply because of random diffusion will also tend to smear out right. And again you can estimate what the smearing out will look like. Uh, so, band of these molecules will move with this velocity. So, the center will move with this V d times t, but this band will also disperse due to diffusion and that is will go as square root of t right. So, if you have two bands of these two molecules. Uh, so, this idea that you have two bands this one moves with some V 1 that one moves with some V 2. But these bands also spread as time grows, these bands also spread become wider because of diffusion. So, let me 
So, this peak moves with a velocity, but it also spreads because of diffusion and in order to in order to have effective separation in this sort of centrifugal systems uh, centrifugation systems the distance between the peaks should be greater than the the width of these the sum of the width of these bands right so this is what is uh, given over here so you can solve for how long you need to wait in order to get an effective separation between these bands or more accurately you can convert this equation to how fast do you need to spin such that you get this effective separation within a within a length which is the length of your test tube and that gives you an estimate of the rotational speed. So, let me say this let me give nothing. So, these bands move with some velocity. these two bands move with some velocity um, and you can calculate how long you need to wait in order for these two bands to be completely separate to be completely separate. So, that you can identify that. Okay. So, that is given by this T separation. Now, in this time T separation this band will have moved let us say one the band which moves with the largest velocity let us say this V 2 is larger than V 1 that will have traveled the distance some V 2 times T separation what you need is that this distance that it has traveled needs to be less than the length of your test tube ok because it should by then it should have separated out the centrifuge tube. So, then that gives you so that you can convert into a constraint on the rotational speed ok uh, on this remember this v is a function of this uh, g c which is a function of this omega. So, that you can convert into a constraint on this g c which tells you given the diffusion coefficients of the particles and their masses and so on uh, with what speed do you need to uh, and the length of the test tube with what speed do you need to rotate in order to get effective separations. And roughly for uh, micron size particles it comes to around 10 to the power of 4 10 to the power of 5 uh, revolutions per minute. So, it uses this concept of this drift velocity in this low Reynolds number regime in order to achieve this sort of effective separation between samples ok. I think I will stop here today because what I want to spend the next class doing is looking at bacterial locomotion. There is this very famous scallop theorem by Purcell, which tells you what are effective. Last class, we asked the question as to what are effective swimming strategies for a micron size bacteria as opposed to a fish, and there is some very classic work by Purcell on that that what swimming strategies work and what do not. Uh, it is a little involved, so I'll, I think I will not uh, put in a break in the middle. So, I will start that next uh, next class on Friday and hopefully finish next class as well. Again, if you are interested in some of the more details of these calculations, this physical hydrodynamics book is a good book to sort of uh, go back and read. Okay. Okay. So, I will stop here today and we will continue next class. Mm -hmm.